guys, welcome to another video from Matt's Toils. So in this video we're going to look at the uh, paper one of the higher tier of the GCSE EdXL from the 19th of May 2023. So this is actually the most recent official paper which is actually available at the moment. Uh, EdXL will be making available the November 2023 uh, shortly. One of the reasons why guys they actually don't make the latest papers available is because they want to Keep, keep hold of them for the mock exams which normally follow at the end of the year. So as soon as the latest papers do get available, guys, uh, I will be sure to uh, get these uploaded. So non-calculated papers, so no calculators for this one. Uh, this is 80 marks and the length of the paper is 1 hour and 30 minutes. So let's get started and let's jump straight in. Question number one. Uh, so it says work out 8.46 divided by 0 0.15. So best way to actually deal with this, guys, is to actually convert this into a fraction. So we're going to say 8.46 over 0 0.15. And then we can actually see that we can multiply the top and bottom by 100, which gives us 846 divided by 15. And then what we want to do, we, we want to see if we can actually go a step further. So really, we just have to use bus stop. Uh, for this. And after we've done bus stop, we can see we're going to end up with something like this. And we can see our answer is going to be 56.4. Okay. We want to make sure as well, guys, that we're getting these earlier questions correct. Okay. We want to make sure that we're getting four marks for anything up to the question number three. Uh, because really, these are the easy questions. This is really where you want to be getting the maximum marks. Number two. Work out 7 and 3 eighths minus 2 and a half. Give you an answer as a mixed number. So the first thing we need to do, we need to convert these values into top heavy fractions. So we've ended up with 59 over 8 minus 5 over 2. What we want to make sure that we do now is to have a common denominator. So we can see by multiplying out that second fraction, we get 59 over 8 minus 20 over 8. This gives us 39 over 8, and then we want to convert this back to a mixed number. So we can see, right, how many 8s go into 13, uh, 9, we can see we've got 8, 16, 32, so that's going to be 4 and 7. Remainder 7, so 4 and 7 8s. And that's going to be our final answer. We can write this down again, just to be on the safe side. Question number 3. A cube has a total surface area of 150 centimetres squared. Work out the volume of the cube. So it's worth probably just doing a quick sketch of a cube. We know that a cube has the same dimensions, don't we? So that's the, that, so that's the first thing. So we need, to, we need to consider that all sides of the cube have a length of x. So we can see the volume is simply just going to be x cubed. But we need to know what x is. Now, hopefully, guys, you'll have noticed that the six sides of the cube. So we need to construct an equation and we can see each face is going to have a surface area of x squared. So six lots of x squared will be the total surface area, which is 150. So we just need to work, work out the value of x. We can see that x squared is therefore going to be 150 over six and 150 over 6, let's see, uh, this looks like it's going to be another bus stop situation. 6 into 1 is 0, carrying 1 over 6 into 15 is 2 remainder 3, and 6 into 30 is 5. So we can see we've got a nice equation, x squared is 25. And taking the positive solution, we can see that x is going to be the square root of 25, which is 5. So this means that the volume is going to be x cubed, which is going to be 5 cubed, which is going to be 1, 2, 5. So our final answer is going to be 125 centimetres cubed. Question four. The table shows information about the daily rainfall in the town for 60 days. So we can see we've got each of these different rows. Uh, uh, between 0 and 5, we've got frequency of 8, 5 and 10, 24, and so on and so on. And we've actually asked to draw a frequency polygon for this information. So what we need to do here, we need to actually... Consider drawing extra columns here. I'm going to put MP for midpoints. 
So we can see we need to take the halfway mark between 0 and 5. The midpoint is going to be 2.5. And we can continue to do the midpoint. You might be wondering why we do this. What we do, we do an estimation of where along the, these intervals, the 8, the 24, and the 13, and so on, are actually going to go. Okay. Now, we don't know what proportion of the 8, for example, goes across from 0 to 5. So we need to assume that the average would actually be halfway between 0 and 5. And we basically do the same for each of the other rows as well. And we can see this last one's going to be 22.5. And what we actually do next, guys, we actually, we're actually going to treat these as coordinates. So we can see midpoint is 2.5 and frequency is of 8. So we can see 2.5 is right about here between the 0 and the 5. And we can see that we've got a frequency of 8. So that's going to be uh, 1 square represents 1 unit. So that's just going to be over here. And we need to go on and complete now the rest of this table. So what we've just done, we've just potted all these points. So what we need to do next, and this is actually the... This is actually what we must always do for frequency polygons. We start, we can see zero is the first point, and we can see that we start from zero over here. And then we can see for 25, again, we've got a frequency of zero since it's strictly less than this particular value. So we also have 25 zero as well. And what's left now is that we draw and we go dot to dot, drawing a line in between all these points. So we've just drawn up all the points, and we can see this doesn't have to be a work of art. We do have to demonstrate that uh, we've got straight lines going in between each of the different points. And that concludes number four, two marks. So easy couple of marks there if you know the procedures and you remember what to actually do. Question number five. So we've got this Venn diagram. It says uh, that the universal set are all the values from one to ten. We've got set A, which represents the odd numbers. Set B, which represents the square numbers, and we are actually asked to complete the Venn diagram for this information, three marks. So, first of all, what we can do here, we can, we can see, can't we, everything in the middle actually represents all the square numbers, which also happen to be odd. And the, thing, the best thing to do here is to actually write out all the odd numbers from 1 to 10, so we can see that's 1, 3... 5, 7, and 9. And we can see all the square numbers are going to be just 4 and 9, because they are the only two square numbers which fall between 1 and 10. So we can see that we can start with the middle. Which value is going to go in the middle? We can see 9 also happens to be in A and B, so we can put 9 here. And all the rest of the values in, in A, we can, act, we can basically just say in set B. So we've got 1, 3, 5, and 7. And then we've got, in fact, we've done that wrong, haven't we? So we need to rub that out and write all the A values over here. Now, the only square number that's even is 4, so we're going to write 4 here. But we also need to remember, guys, that... We have to not forget about the remaining values, which are not odd numbers and also not square numbers as well. So we can see 2 isn't odd, and it's not a square number. Uh, 4 and 5 have already got 6 is not odd, and it's not a square number. And neither are the remaining two values, 8 and 10. So we can see now we've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Three marks, very easy marks to acquire for this uh, particular part of the question. Now, it goes on, it says, a number is chosen at random from the universal set epsilon. Find the probability that this number is in the set of not B. So B prime, this actually means the complement of B. Okay. So the first thing that we need to do, we need to find out which part of the Venn diagram represents not B in and B. And that's everywhere, basically, in this green shaded region over here. So we can see that the probability that it's not in B is going to be the number of elements which are not in B divided by the total number of elements in the actual Venn diagram. Okay. 
So this n means the number of elements or the number of members. Okay, so that's really, really important. So we need to count how many values are not in B. So we can see we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So we've got eight members not in B, divided by the total number of members, which is 10. And we can also see that eight over 10 will simplify down to four over five. Question number six. Uh, so part A, it says the scatter graph shows information about the ages and weights of some babies. We've got the weights going up the vertical axis in kilograms, and we've got the age of the babies uh, going on the x-axis in months. Describe the relationship between the age and the weight of the babies. Now, hopefully what you can see here, guys, is we've actually got a positive correlation because as we increase the weight, so does the age increase and vice versa. So we can see that the, the relationship is a positive Correlation. Okay, part B. Two marks. Another baby has a weight of 5.8 kilograms. Using the scatter graph, find an estimate for the age of this baby. So what we need to do here, guys, we need to actually draw a line of best fit. So we need to take our ruler and we need to roughly draw our line of best fit. And we want to make sure that we've roughly got equal, uh, an equal number of points on either side. Okay. Don't worry about it if it's not exact, because there is a margin of error. This is only an estimation, okay? So it can normally be between uh, certain values. Uh, so don't worry about having to get this exactly right. So 5.8. So we, we need to find out where exactly 5.8 is. And we can see that we've got 5 over here. 5 squares represents one value. So 5.8 is going to be 1 square below the six. So we've drawn our line going horizontally across. We can see from this, guys, that um, over here we've got 5.8 kilograms. We hit the line, then we go down, and we can see, again, we can see we've got three over here. So one square represents 0 0.2, which means two squares from three means that we've got 3.4. So basically, we've just worked out that the age is going to be 3.4 months old, because it's two squares from the three. Question number seven, two marks. Price for holiday increases by 20%. This 20% increase adds £240 to the price of a holiday. Work out the price of a holiday before the increase. Okay, so for this, guys, what we need to do, we need to sort of try and work backwards, don't we? Now, this is how I normally do this. Let's suppose the original price of a holiday is actually represented as 100%. Okay. Now, we've just been told that a 20% increase, it says that it adds £240 to the price of a holiday. Okay. So what we can do here, we can say that. That, that basically means, guys, 20% represents £240. Now, we've already considered that the original price represents 100%. So, since the original price is 100%, what we can do here, we can say, right, well, we know that 20% is £240. So, how can we work out 100%? And hopefully what we recognise is that going from 20 to 100 means that we have to multiply by 5. So that also means that we need to multiply 240 by 5 to work out what the original price actually was. So what we need to do, we need to take 240, we need to times that by 5. Again, we can't use a calculator, so we have to do this manually. 0 times 5 is 0, 2 fives is 20, carry the 2 over here, 2 times 5 plus the 2 is 12. So we can see that altogether we've actually got 1,200. A great way as well, guys, to, to check that this is correct is by recognising that 20% of 1,200 is the same as 20% uh, times 1,200, uh, 1, and that's the same as simply dividing 1,200 by 5, which brings us back to 240. So you don't have to do this, but it's good peace of mind to know for sure that your answer is going to be correct. 
Question number eight, three marks. So in this question, then, it says uh, the diagram shows a solid cylinder on a horizontal floor. We're given the formula that pressure equals force over area, and we're also given the height of the cylinder, which is 40 centimetres. We're given that the volume is 1,200 centimetres cubed. The cylinder exerts a force of 90 newtons on the floor. Work out the pressure on the floor due to the cylinder. Right. So let's have a look at this. We're given a nice formula over here as well. So the pressure we're trying to find, the force we know, the area we also don't know. However, if we know the area, guys, we can work out the pressure because then we've got all the information that we need. So when it says area, it's talking about this cross-sectional area over here. So first of all, the volume of the, of the cylinder is actually the area of the cross-section multiplied by the height. Now, it does actually tell us the volume over here, it's 1,200. Um, or should I say the volume. We also know that the height is 40 centimetres. So we can work out the cross-sectional area by taking the volume and dividing that by the height. The volume is 1,200 and the height is 40. And we can see 1,200 divided by 40 is the same as... 120 over 4, if we divide the top and bottom by 10. We know that 12 over 4 is 3, so 120 divided by 4 is 30. So that means that the area must therefore be 30 centimetres squared. So we've now got all the information that we need because now we know what the area actually is. We can use our formula that the pressure is going to be the force, which is 90 newtons, divided by 30 centimetres squared. And we can see 90 divided by 30 is 3. So that's going to be 3 newtons per centimetre squared. Uh, we can see that the um, units are already given over here, so our exact value for this is simply just going to be 3. Okay. So that takes care of question number 8. Question number 9. So... Only one mark actually required for this particular question. So it says, use the graphs to solve the simultaneous equations. So we can see, basically, we've got two simultaneous equations. We've got 2 minus 2y equals x and 2y equals 3x minus 22. Now, hopefully, what you recognize here, guys, is that the top equation represents this line. And we can see that the bottom equation, 2y plus 3x minus 22, represents this line. So using graphs to solve simultaneous equations is an extremely useful tool because what this basically means is that the solutions to simultaneous equations are exactly the same as points of intersections between two equations of lines. So we can see that our, our solution is going to be this point of intersection over here. And hopefully what we notice, at this point of intersection, we can see we've got x equals 4. And at the horizontal, sorry, at the vertical axis, we can see this is actually going to be minus 2. So the coordinates are at 4 minus 2. So that means that x equals 4 and y equals minus 2. One mark. Question number 10. So for number 10, it says... Uh, this question's four marks. So it says here is a pentagon. Uh, we've got angle ADE, which is four times angle ABC. And we've actually asked to work out the size of the angle AED. So let's have a look at this. The best thing to do here is to actually represent these angles as variables. So AED means that we're going from A to E to D. So we always go over the middle angle, the middle letter, which is over here. Let's suppose this was x. Then if angle ABC, which is this angle over here, is four times greater than AED, we can represent ABC to be 4x, like this. Work out the size of angle AED. So what we can do next, guys, we can actually recognize that 
We need to work out the total interior angles now. And we can see, we can work this out by finding out how many triangles fit in to this pentagon. We can see that there's actually three triangles which fit into the pentagon. So we know that the total angles in a triangle add up to 180. So the total angles in the pentagon is 1 times 80. Uh, sorry, 3 times 180. And we can see that this is actually equal to the sum of all the angles. So we've now constructed an equation by adding all the angles up on the right-hand side. We know, that that, we know that that gives a total of 540 on the left-hand side. So we've got 540 on the left-hand side. And we need to add 110, 135, and 120. So let's see. 110 plus 135 is 245. Plus 120, uh, that gives us 365. So 540 equals 365. Plus 5x. And then this is no more now than a two-step equation, which we can now move on and solve. This basically means that 5x is going to be 540 minus 365. We can find some space over here to work this out. If this is a little bit too taxing for us. So we borrow from the 4. We can see 10 minus 5 is 5. Borrow from 5. 13 minus 6 is 7. 4 minus 3 is 175. So this basically means that 5x is equal to 175. So to work out x, or basically our angle of AED, we need to take, we know that AED is basically just going to be equal to x, which is 175 over 5. And 175 over 5 we can work out again by using bus stop. 5 into 17 is 3. Carry over 2 over 5 into 35 is uh, 25 is, is 5. So we can see that means that our angle is 35 degrees. Question number 11. So now we've got questions to do with simplifying an expression. Write 6x to the 5y cubed, brackets squared, over 3x squared y to the 7 times 3xy to the minus 3 in the form of ax to the by to the c where a, b and c are integers. So the best, thing, the best way to actually get started with this, guys, is to actually uh, simplify the top and the bottom. So first of all, we can see this is exactly the same as saying... 6 squared, so 6 squared is going to be 6 squared, we can write this out. Then we've got x to the power of 5, that's the same as x to the 5 squared times y cubed squared. So we're squaring each of the individual terms within the brackets. Next what we need to do, we need to use the rules of the indices now. We can see we've got 3 times 4 which is 12, x squared times x which is x cubed, y to the 7 times y to the minus 3. And what we can see here is that we need to take these powers and actually add them up. So adding minus 3 is the same as subtracting 3. So that means that we've got 12x cubed y to the 4. And then we can tidy up the top. So we've got 6 squared, which is 36. x to the 5 squared is actually the same as x to the power of 5 times 2. So we multiply the indices together. That gives us x to the power of 10. So we can say 36x to the 10. y cubed squared in the same way, 3 times 2 is 6. So we've got 36x to the 10, y to the 6, over 12, x cubed, y to the 4. Now what we can do, guys, we can actually treat these individually now. So we can say, this is how I do it anyway. This is much easier to actually do this. We can just consider only the numbers, only the x's, and only the y's. 
36 over 12 is 36 divided by 12, which is 3. x to the 10 divided by x to the 3 is x to the 10 minus 3. y to the 6 divided by y to the 4 is y to the 6 minus 4. And that gives us 3x to the 7 y squared. Job done. Question number 12. Three marks. So for this question, it says Martha plays a game twice. The probability tree diagram shows the probabilities that Martha will win or lose each game. So we've already got a probability tree diagram provided to us. Uh, so what we need to do next, we need to actually uh, we need to actually try and work out the probability that Martha will lose at least one game. Okay, so. Let's see. First of all, there's two possibilities here, isn't there? It says at least one, sorry, three possibilities. So Martha can either win both games, so we could have win-win. Or we could have uh, win-lose. Or we could have lose-win. This represents winning at least one game. We don't consider lose-lose because no games have been won at all. Now, the most important thing with probability, guys, is that or is associated with adding, and is associated with multiplication, as we'll see. So what we need to do, we need to work out the probability of Martha winning both games. Since it's an or situation, we are adding the probability of win, lose, plus the probability of lose, win. So win, win, both events have to happen in such a way that Martha wins both games. So winning the first game and winning the second game means that we take 5 over, five over 8 and we multiply 2 over 9 because both games have to be won together. What we can do next, guys, we can cross-cancel. So we can see 2 divided by 2 is 1, 8 divided by 2 is 4. No other room for cross-cancelling anywhere else. 5 times 1 is 5. 4 times 9 is 45. 5 over 45 simplifies to 1 over 9 if we divide the top and bottom by 5. So we can see we've got 1 over 9. Probability of win-lose. Again, we do the same sort of thing here. We've got 5 over 8 times 7 over 9. Now, we can see here uh, there's no room for cross-cancelling this time. 5 times 7 is 35. 8 times, 8 times 9 is going to be 72. So we've got 30... Let's see, we've got 35 over 72. Now, it makes sense, I think, if we actually change 1 over 9. And we actually... Because I can see, just by looking at this, that we may while actually have um, everything over 72. So we need to make sure, I'm looking ahead and I can see that we need a common denominator. So the best thing to do here is to multiply the top and bottom by eight to give us eight over 72. So I'm gonna change one over nine over here for eight over 72. Then we've got 35 over 72 for the probability of um, win-lose and then finally, we've got the probability of lose win, which is 3 over 8 times 2 over 9. 3 2 is a 6. 8 9 is 72. So then we've got plus 6 over 72. So we can see 8 plus 6 is going to be equal to 14. 14 plus 35 is going to be 49. So we've got 49 over 72, and we can see... By dividing both the top and bottom by 7, we can see that 49 divided by 7 is 7. 72 divided by 7 actually doesn't work at all. Uh, so actually, 49 over 72 is actually as far as we can go. We can't simplify this fraction anymore. And even if we, even if we, we still wouldn't get penalised because it doesn't necessarily tell us that we have to simplify um, our working out. So that would be our final solution. Question number 13. 
So it says, y is directly proportional to x. So straight away, we can actually convert this into a mathematical statement where y is proportional to x. And the first thing that we can do, guys, we can actually change this into an equation, okay? And normally, we want this is exactly the same as actually saying y equals kx, where k is some constants, okay? So we're given information. When y is 24, x is 1.5. So we can say that means that 24 is equal to k times 1.5. So to work out k, we can say that that's 24 divided by 1.5, 1 and a half. Now, without a calculator, the best thing to do is to convert 1.5 into a fraction. So that's 24 divided by 3 over 2. The 2 is the denominator of the denominator, which works its way up top. So we multiply 2 by 24. 2 times 24 is 48. So we've got 48 over 3. Okay. Now, the next thing that we need to do, we need to see if this actually simplifies. So, does 3 divide into 48? 3 into 4 is 1. Carry the 1 over 3 into 18 is going to be equal to 6. So, we can see k is 16. So, subbing k equals 16 back into here means that y is going to be 16x. Work out the value of y when x equals 5. We can basically say that that means that y is equal to 16 times 5. 16 times 5 is going to be 10 times 5 plus 6 times 5, which is 5 plus 30, which is 80. So y is equal to 80 is going to be our final solution. Question number 14. Uh, part A, write 1 16 in the form of 4 to the power of n, where n is an integer. So hopefully, guys, what you notice is that 16 is actually a square number. So the first thing that we can notice here is that 16 is actually equal to 4 squared. So this means that 1 over 16 is equal to 1 over 4 to the power of 2. But we, we want to get rid of this 1, so we're using another rule of indices where if you've got a to the power of minus b, that's the same as 1 over a to the b. So this is effectively the same as 4 to the minus 2. And that takes care of part a. Part B, uh, it now says, work out the value of 8 to the power of 5 over 3 minus 9 to the power of 3 over 2. And this is where it gets a little bit complicated. So for this, what we can do here, we can split up this and we can actually express it in a slightly different way. So we're doing the reverse of using the rules of indices. We can actually... We can rewrite five to the eight to the five over three to be eight to the power of third brackets to the power of five. So we're actually doing the reverse of using the rules of indices. Uh, five times a third is five over three, but it does split this operation up. And we can do the same for nine. So we've got nine to the power of a half cubed. Then the next step, guys, is to convert from indices to radical form. So hopefully what you guys know see is that 8 to the third is actually the same as the cube root of 8. Then we raise into the power of 5. Then we've got the square root of 9 to the power of 3. So the cube root of 8, that's a value which we multiply together three times to give us 8. So the cube root of 8 is 2. So we first work out everything inside of the brackets before we raise it. So that's really, really important. So we've got 2 to the power of 5 minus square root of 9, which is 3. So that's going to be 3 cubed. So 2 to the power of 5, that's 2 times 2 times 2 times 2 times 2. Uh, let's see, that's 4, that's 4. We know that 4 times 4 is 16 times the 2 is 32. 3 cubed is 3 times 3 times 3. That's 9 times 3, which is going to be equal to 27. So altogether, we've got 32 minus 27, which is just going to be equal to 5. 
So this is really important. What you don't want to do, guys, is to take eight to the power of five and then take the cube roots because then you're going to be dealing with a really, really large number. So you always want to take the, the nth root before you raise it. If you raise it first, you're going to deal with extremely large values, which is just going to be wasting time. We want to try and avoid that because um, time is very, very precious in an exam situation. So we always want to choose the path of least resistance. That's really, really important. Question number 15. The equation of the line L1 is y plus 2x minus 5. The equation of L2 is 6y plus kx minus 12 equals 0. L1 is perpendicular to L2. Work out the value of k. You must show all your working. So the first thing that we want to do, we want to make sure that both of these equations are represented in the form of y plus mx plus c. That's really, really important. So, first of all, we've got L1. It's already in the form of y plus mx plus c, isn't it? So, we can see already that for L1, the gradient is, the gradient is actually equal to 2, and the y inception is equal to minus 5. Okay, uh, so m equals 2, c equals minus 5, dead easy. Now, for L2, we need to do a little bit more work because we need to rearrange this equation and make wider subjects. So the kx and the minus 12 need to go on the right-hand side. So this means that 6y is going to be equal to minus kx plus 12. Dividing both sides by 6 means that y is going to be equal to minus k over 6x. 12 divided by 6 is 2. So we can see from this that the gradient of L2 is going to be minus k over 6, and the y-inception is equal to minus 5. Sorry, minus t uh, plus 2. So, where do we go with this? What do we do next? Well, this is really important, guys. Whenever two lines are perpendicular to each other, okay, where you've got You've got a gradient to M1 for this line and a gradient to M2 with this line. If two, if two lines are perpendicular, that basically means that the product of those two gradients has to be equal to minus 1. That's really, really, uh, that's really essential that you know that. If you don't know this formula, it makes it really difficult to actually go any further with this question. Okay, so M1 times M2, I'm going to call this M1, I'm going to call this M2, has to be equal to minus 1. So we can construct an equation with the information that we've currently got for M1 and M2. And we can say, right, subbing these values in, that means that 2 times minus k over 6 equals minus 1. So that basically means... We can multiply these two things together. So we've got minus 2k on 6 is minus 1. Multiplying both sides by 6 means that minus 2k equals minus 6. And then dividing both sides by minus 2 means that k equals minus 6 over minus 2, which is just going to be equal to 3. So that basically means that uh, our k value is equal to 3. And we've uh, concluded question number 15. M1 times M2 equals minus 1. That's exactly the same as saying that the gradient of one line is the negative reciprocal of the other, where you swap the numerator and denominator, numerator and denominator together, and then times by minus 1. Question 16, four marks. So we can see these questions now are really starting to get more and more difficult. Uh, so they get a little bit more challenging. Nevertheless, nothing we can't handle. Uh, so we've got a sphere, radius r. It tells us that the surface area of the sphere is 4 pi r squared. 3 eighths of the surface area of this sphere is, 20, is 75 pi centimeters squared. Okay. Find the diameter of the sphere. Right, okay. So, if the surface area of the sphere is 4 pi r squared, that basically tells us then, if 3 apes times the surface area must be 3 to the 3 apes times 4 pi r squared. Okay, makes sense. 
Uh, the surface area we don't know, but we do know that three eighths of the surface area is 75 pi. Okay, so all we've got to do now, guys, is to actually uh, tidy up the right hand side, and we can do that by saying that 75 pi is three eighths times four. Well, three eighths times four. Is the same as 3 eighths times 4 over 1, which is 12 over 8. 12 over 8 is equal to 3 on 2. If we divide the top and the bottom by 4. So then we've got 3 over 2 pi r squared. And if we know r, all we've got to do then is times it by 2, and that gives us the diameter because the diameter is actually two lots of. The radius. What we can also see as well, guys, for both sides of this equation is that the pi's cancel out by dividing the both sides by pi. So now we can see we can also get rid of the denominator on the right hand side by multiplying both sides by two. Seventy five times two is one fifty. Three over two times two is three. So one fifty equals 3r squared. So dividing both sides by 3 means that r squared equals 150 over 3, which is 50. So r is actually going to be equal to plus or minus the square root of 50. But we can't have a negative radius, can we? So we disregard the negative solution. So r is actually equal to the square root of 50. Just take that positive solution. Now, it says, give your answer in the form of a root b, where a is an inch and b is a prime number. So we're not out of the woods just yet. We've still got work to do, haven't we, guys? Because we can see this is not in the form of a root b. So what we need to do, we need to, we call this, put in the final answer into third form. And we do this by looking at square numbers, which are factors of 50. So we call those square factors. So I can see that 25 is a square number, and it's a square factor of 50. So we can change 50 for 25 times 2, okay? And we can see from this that uh, that's the same as the square root of 25 times the square root of 2. Root 25 is 5, so r is 5 root 2, which is going to be equal to 5 root 2. But... We want to make sure, don't we, that it's actually twice of that value. So diameter is 2r, so it's going to be 2 lots of 5 root 2, which is going to be 10 root 2 centimetres. Two is, 2 is the b number, which is prime, and 10 is the integer. 10 root 2. Question number 17. So for this question, it says make x the subject of a formula y equals 4, brackets 2x minus 7, over 5x plus 3. So what we can see here, guys, is that we can see, can't we, that actually x is in two different places. And we, and we want to try and make x the, sub, the subject. So what do we do about that? Where do we, what do we do? Well, normally in this situation, this means that we want x in terms of y. So what we do, we need to get rid of the denominators. That's the first thing. So we multiply on both sides by 5x plus 3. And we have to make sure that it's all of 5x plus 3, that it's all the denominators, so that's why we're using brackets. So we've got y times all of 5x plus 3. The denominators go away on the right-hand side, gives us 4 brackets 2x minus 7. And now, if we actually, if you notice, we can actually multiply all the brackets. So, y times 5x is 5xy. But then we also have to remember to multiply the 3 by y, so that's going to be plus 3y. Right-hand side, in the same way, we've got 8x minus 28. And now, we want to make x the subject. So the most important thing is now, although we have an x in two different places, we want to make sure that all the x terms are on one side. So I think it's best if we bring the 5xy over to the right-hand side and 
we take the minus 28 and we take that to the left hand side. So that means that we've got 3y minus minus 28, which is plus 28, equals 8x minus 5xy. And then what we can do, we can actually make x, to, we can actually go from having x in two different places to only having x in one different place. And we actually do that, guys, by factorising. So we take out a factor of x. So then we say that that's x brackets 8 minus 5y. And the, way to, and the way to check that this is correct is by multiplying it back out and checking that it's the same. In this, in, if you notice now, we've just gone from having x in two different places over here to only having x in one different place. Okay? And then what we can do, we can divide both sides by 8 minus 5y, and we have then successfully made x for subjects. So x is equal to 3y plus 28 over 8 minus 5y. And then we also want to make sure that we actually write this out again, just to make sure that we've dotted the i's and crossed the c's, and that concludes question number 17. Question 18. 7 kilograms of carrots and 5 kilograms of tomatoes cost a total of 480 pence. The cost of 1 kilogram of carrots to the cost of 1 kilogram of tomatoes is 5 to 9. Work out the cost of 1 kilogram of carrots and the cost of 1 kilogram of tomatoes. Right, so the best thing to do with this, guys, is to actually... Let's consider what's going on, first of all, with the um, sort of parts to the ratio. Let's see, we know altogether if we add up the number of parts, we know that there's 14 parts altogether in this ratio. So that's the most important thing, first of all. Now, 7 kilograms of carrots, 5 kilograms of tomatoes cost 480. That's, that we know at the moment. So what we need to try and do is to construct an equation based off this ratio alone. Okay. So we can rewrite this ratio. We've got C for carrots, we've got T for tomatoes, and we have a ratio of 5 to 9. So let's suppose a tomato was to cost 9 pence. That means that a carrot would cost 5 pence, wouldn't it? If you double the price of a tomato, you also need to double the price of a carrot. So we can convert this, and there's a technique to actually constructing equations based off ratios. We can basically say, in this case, that 9c is equal to 5t. And this makes sense, doesn't it? If we, if we, double, if we double the value of t, we also double the value of uh, c as well. If t is 5, c is going to be 5 over 9. So it makes sense that we can construct this, base, ratio, construct this equation based off the ratio that we've already got. Okay, so that's the first thing. We also know we've been given another formula, haven't we? We also know that 7 kilograms of carrots and 5 kilograms of tomatoes is 480. So we could say, okay then, 7c plus 5t equals 480. Okay. So what we can do next, we can actually treat these as simultaneous equations. Okay. And we can do that by actually eliminating t. If you notice, we've actually got a 5t over here and over here, so we can actually substitute equation 1 into equation 2. So where we've got the 5t, we can actually replace that with 9c in equation 2. 7 plus 9 is actually equal 16, so that means we've got 16 lots of c, which equals 480. Now, fortunately, 480 is at, well, 48 is a multiple of 16 because 3 times 16 is 48. So that basically means that um, 30 times 16 is going to be 480, which means that C is actually going to be equal to 30. So straight away we can say that C is actually equal to 30 pence. Since C is, for, since C, C is 30 pence, we can then use that information to work out what T actually is. Uh, we know that t is equal to 9 
see on 5, so that's going to be 9 times 30 all over 5. 9 times 30 is equal to 270. 270 over 5 is going to be equal to 54. And that takes care of question number 18. Question number 19, two marks this question. This looks like a combinations type question. It says the menu in a restaurant has starters, main courses and desserts. There are five starters, 12 main desserts and X desserts. In 12 main courses, sorry. There are 420 different ways to choose one starter, one main course and one dessert. So the way to find out how many different combinations there are is to actually multiply these values together. So what this basically tells us is that uh, the number of starters times the number of main courses, which is 12, times x desserts, the product of these values is the total number of options. And we're actually given this 420 different ways. And then what we can do, we can simplify this equation and solve for x. So 5 times 12 is 60. So 60 times x is equal to 420. And this basically means that x is going to be 420 divided by 60. Now, 420 divided by 60, since the, both of these values actually end in 0, that's the same as 42 divided by 6. And of course, we know that 42 divided by 6 is going to equal some value, isn't it? So let's have, let's have a think about this. We know that, uh, let's see, 6, 8 to 48, so 6, 7 are 42. So x is going to be 7. Question number 20. For x is greater than or equal to 0, the functions f and g are such that f of x is 3x plus 4, and g of x equals the square root of x plus 2 on 5. Find the inverse g of x. Right, so you will never have a problem with inverses again, as long as you follow these two steps. So the first step, there's many different ways of doing this, but this is the easiest way by far. Step one is to make x the subject. That's step two. Let's stop. That's step one. Step two is we change g of x for x, and we change x for g to the minus one of x. Now this might not make very much sense at first glance, but basically there is a lot of um, there's a lot of mathematics going on behind the scenes, which does make it so that this actually works out. So, so bear with me. As long as you just remember those two rules, it doesn't, you don't have to worry too much about why it works. As long as you know that that's, that will do the job, you'll never have a problem with inverses again. I guarantee you. So let's just follow the first two steps and see how we get on. We're taking g of x, and we need to make x the subject. So this basically means then that... Um, 5g of x is root x plus 2. Uh, that's the same, actually, guys, as changing around the equation. Root x plus 2 is 5g of x. Then we can, multi then we can subtract 2 from the right-hand side. So root x equals 5g of x minus 2. And then to go from root x to x, because we need to make x the subject, we need to square both sides. So, square both sides like this. The square root of x squared is just x. And that equals 5g of x minus 2 all squared. So step 1 is actually complete. And what we're going to do now, we're just going to change, we're just going to um, follow the second step. Change g of x for x and change x for g to the minus 1 of x. So that means that g to the minus 1 of x is 5x minus 2 all squared. And then we can write it down again over here just to make sure. And that's really all, all it takes to, to actually work out our inverse. It doesn't have to be more difficult than what it actually is. There's many ways that I'm sure your teachers have actually shown you. And I'm sure your teachers are correct. But 
being a teacher myself, this is by far going to be the easiest way. Uh, nevertheless, if you know, uh, if you're comfortable with the way you're doing it, which is different from this, that's okay too. Part B, uh, we need to solve gf of x equals 3, 3 marks. So for this, guys, what you really want to do for this, you want to find out what this is. This is actually a composite function, so it's a function of a function. And we can write this out in a different way. This is how I normally do this. g f of x equals 3, that's exactly the same as saying g of f of x equals 3. Okay? So that's the first thing. The next thing that we can do, guys, is this is how I normally do this. We know that g of x equals the square root of x plus 2 over 5. But the thing is, our inputs, and this is our inputs just over here. Now, our input does not necessarily have to be x. The input can be absolutely anything. So I'll say that again. The input can be absolutely anything. So it doesn't actually need to be x. It could be f of x, just like we've got over here. So basically, all we've got to do is to replace x for f of x. So g of f of x will be the square root of f of x plus 2 all over 5. And what we can also see is that f of x can be replaced with, uh, with 3x plus 4. So we're changing f of x to 3x plus 4. We want to make sure that all the 3x plus 4 goes into the square root. Then we've got the 2 that goes outside on it. So... Straight away, we can see then now that g of f of x equals 3. So g of f of x is the square root of 3x plus 4 plus 2 on 5 equals 3. And then what we want to do, we want to try and make this whole thing the subject so then we can square it back out and do some more rearranging. So the first thing that we need to do, we need to multiply both sides by 5 and then subtract 2, so square root of 3x plus 4 equals 15. In fact, uh, I've skipped an extra step there. I'm going to say plus 2 equals 15. And we want to make sure that the 2 is, is outside of the square root, so I'm putting some brackets there. Bringing the 2 to the other side, the square root of 3x plus 4 is equal to 13. Squaring both sides gets rid of the square root on the left-hand side, so 3x plus 4 is equal to 13 squared, which is 169. Taking the 4 over to the other side means that 3x equals 165. And then we can see that uh, x is going to be 165 on 3. Uh, let's see, 3 into 16 is... 3 into 16 is 5... It's 5 remainder 1, which gives us 53. Uh, not 53, 55. Just have to be careful about the arithmetic. And that's it. X is 55, 3 marks. So, lots of working out required. Personally, I think this should have been worth more than 3 marks because there's a lot of working out required. But, nevertheless, we want to make sure that... Uh, we get to the very end and we, um, yeah, get the solution that we wanted. Question number 21. So moving on to circle theorems. Uh, next question is worth four marks. So it says A, B, C, D are points on the circle with centre O. C, D, E is the tangent of the circle at D. Work out the size of angle A, B, C. Write down any circle theorems you use. Right, so... First thing that we can do, we can see O to D is actually the radius, okay? So we can see, since CD is a tangent, we can straight away see that we've actually got a right angle just here. Okay, so that's going to be really uh, useful for us. The angle ADC is this angle over here, isn't it? So we can actually call ADC angle X. Okay, so that's the first thing. 
Now, what we can actually see from this is what we also actually know is we've also got a radius over here. Now, we can see because the radius actually meets the tangents at, um, at right angles, that's basically, that's basically the first circle theorem that we can actually write down. So we can say um, circle theorem radius meets the line C, the E, the tangents at 90 degrees. And that's going to be extremely useful for us. Now I'm going to introduce another variable now. And I'm going to say, I'm going to let O, D, A be equal to Y. Because what we can see also is that X plus Y equals 90. Because C, D, E is a straight line which adds up to 180. Good. Now, what I'm also going to do, I'm going to draw another line going from O to A. Okay. And what we can see, O to A is also the radius. So that means that the triangle OAD is an isosceles, which means that the two angles are also the same. So we can say that A we can see that AOD is equal to Y. So that's the first thing. And then what we can also see as well is that the line O to B is also the radius. So that basically means that triangle OAB is also an isosceles, which means that OAB, the angle OAB is 51 degrees. So we can say AOB is 51 degrees. Therefore, Angle AOB, since all three angles have to have it put into a triangle, we can see OAB is actually going to be 180 minus 51 minus another 51, which gives us 78 degrees. So 78 degrees we can actually put inside here. And then what we can do, we can say from the triangle of OAD, that's also an isosceles. We can construct an equation and say that 2y, so you're looking at this triangle just here now, 2y plus all of angle O, which is 78 and 64, is equal to 180 degrees. And we can easily now, guys, actually work out y by simply just solving this equation. So the first thing that we need to do, we need to add... 78 and 64 together. Now, we know 78 plus uh, 60 is 138. So that's going to be 142 in that case. I'm just going to double check with my arithmetic. Uh, let's see, 14, 142. So we can see that 2y plus 1 or 2 is equal to 180. If we take the 142 away from 180, we can see that 2y actually gives us 38 degrees, which means that y is equal to 19 degrees. Since y is equal to 19, we can go back to our original equation over here. We know what y is, so we can therefore say we can say we can therefore say that uh, x plus y equals 90. So x is equal to 90 minus 19, which means that uh, x is going to be equal to 71 degrees, which of course is the same as the angle ABC, which we've established uh, before. So that concludes question number 21. Quite a lot of working out required there. Really, the most important thing is uh, there's nothing wrong with adding stuff into the diagram. Okay, there may be many other alternative approaches to take in this question as well, but the most important thing is that you choose a method which is right for you. And even if you're not sure, guys, just, just fill in as much as you can to the diagram, and that will give you the best chance of getting as much credit as you uh, possibly need. So that's really, really important. Question number 22. So coming towards the end of this paper now, it says A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H is a cuboid. 
AF, and there's two marks, so not very many marks this question, AF is 6.8 centimetres. So the first thing that we can do, guys, is to um, put this information into the diagram. 6.8 centimetres. We have FC, which is 13.6 centimetres. So what we need to do for this is to draw a line going from F to C, like this. And we're going to write 13 0.6 centimetres. Okay. Work out the size of the angle between FC and the plane ABCD. Right. So I'm going to add an extra line for this. And what we need to do here, guys, we need to consider the line AC. Now, the line AC is actually running across the plane. Now, the plane is perpendicular to the height of FA. So we can actually also add a right angle to this. So that's also really important. Now, the, an the, the angle between FC and the plane is this angle over here. So I'm going to call this angle, angle theta. Okay. And we can see, what we're considering now is the triangle of ACF. And we can see this has actually become nothing more than a standard trick problem. So we can see 6.8 centimetres is our opposite. Our hypotenuse is 13.6 centimetres and our adjacent is AC. So what we're doing next, we're considering soccer toe, aren't we? We need, to de we need to determine or establish whether to use sine, cos or tan. So we've got sine theta, which is the opposite over the hypotenuse. We've got cos theta, which is the adjacent over the hypotenuse. And then finally, we've got tan theta, which is the opposite over the adjacent. So let's, uh, let's see. We don't know the adjacent, so we don't want to know the adjacent. We know the hypotenuse, and we know the um, opposite. So we can see that our conclusion is that we need to use sine. So what we do next, we want to work out the angle. So we can say sine theta, our angle, is 6.8 for our opposite divided by... 13.6, which is our hypotenuse. And then all we've got to do then is take inverse sine of 6.8 over 13.6. Now, this may seem a little bit complicated, but hopefully what you notice here is actually 6.8 is actually half of 13.6. So this whole thing simplifies to inverse sine of a half, okay? So we can go back and we can say, right, sine theta is equal to a half. Now, this requires, some, this requires some really important knowledge. Now, we need to know from memory what this actually is. And we can see, if we consider a um, right angle triangle where this is 1, this is 2, and this is root 3 from our knowledge of Pythagoras, we can see that theta is going to have to be over here because one needs to be the opposite. And since this comes from an equal, since this comes from an equilateral triangle, we know that this is sixty degrees, which means that our angle theta is therefore equal to thirty degrees. So inverse sine of a half is just going to be thirty degrees in this case. And that actually concludes question number twenty-two. So a little bit of a twist at the end there, but it's important to remember that sine theta equals a half uh, is something that you're aware of with your knowledge of angles associated with that uh, formula. Two more questions remaining. Uh, question number 23, uh, four marks this question's worth. So for this it says, write three root three over four minus root three minus two over root three in the form of a root three plus b over c, where a, b and c are integers. So the first thing that we need to do, we need to rationalise the denominator for both of these expressions. So first of all, we can find some space and we can consider what's going on over 3 root 3 minus, over 4 minus root 3. And what you need to do for this, guys, is to rationalise the denominator, you need to multiply by almost the same as the denominator, but with a different sign. And that basically means that we 
we will have a situation where the ball will freeze cancel out. Whatever we do to the bottom, though, we have to do the same at the top. So we're also going to be multiplying the top by 4 plus root 3. So multiplying out the brackets from the top, four, uh, 3 root 3 times 4 is 12 root 3. 3 root 3 times root 3 is 3 times 3, which is 9. And then at the bottom, we can see if we carry out our operations, we end up with the following. We end up with 4 times 4, which is 16. Then we've got plus 4 root 3, minus 4 root 3. Hopefully, you guys are familiar with how this all works, with, especially this being a um, high GCSE paper. The 4 root 3s cancel out. So we've successfully rationalised the denominator. Uh, we've got 12 root 3 plus 9 over 13. Okay. So straight away what we can do here, we can put a tick next to this top term. Excellent, nicely done. Next we've got uh, minus 2 over root 3. So we can see 2 over root 3. Rationalising the denominator this is going to be much easier than the previous term. We just multiply the top and bottom by root 3. That gives us 2 root 3 over 3. So, we've now successfully managed to, um, to actually do both of these uh, terms. So now we can actually rewrite this. I'm going to label this star, save as having to write the original thing out again. All really good time management. So we've got 12 root 3 plus 9 over 13. Plus 2 root 3 over 3. I'm going to put brackets around the 12 root 3 plus 9. That's going to make more sense as we combine these two fractions. The next thing that we need to do, guys, is we need to cross multiply. So we do that by multiplying the 3 and the 13 together. 3 times 13 is 39. And then we cross multiply. So it's 3 times 12 root 3 plus 9. And then we've got 13 times 2 root 3. And it's all of 12 root 3 plus 9 we multiply. We need to multiply the 3 by. And then, of course, we've got 13 times 2 root 3. And we can see we're actually almost there. We've, we've already got the C value, which we need, multiplying out the brackets. 3 12s are 36 lots of root 3. 3 9s are 27. 13 times 2 is 26 root 3. And then we can see. All we've got to do is to combine the uh, 36 and the 26. 36 plus 26 is 66 minus 4, which is 62. So that's 62 root 3 plus 27 over 39. And we can see that actually uh, concludes our um, question for number 23. Question number 24, final question now on this exam, which is almost always going to be the um, going to be the most difficult question. Five marks, just so you get a glance of how much work we need to do. We're going to zoom in to make this a little bit easier. Find the set of possible values for x, which is 4x squared minus 25 is less than 0, and 12 minus 5x minus 3x squared is greater than 0. You must show all your work and right. So the first thing I'm going to do, I can, I can see that there's no x term for the first inequality, so you can easily deal with the first one by taking the 25 over to the right-hand side. Dividing both sides by 4 means that x squared is going to be less than 25 over 4. And then what we can see, guys, is we can also see now x squared is less than... 25 over 4. So, what this basically means is that x is going to be less than the square root of 25 over 4. So, that means that x is going to be less than 5 over 2. However, we can also see, can't we, guys, that uh, x can also be a negative value. When we multiply a negative value by itself, we're also going to get the same as well. So, we also have to consider that x is also has to be greater than minus 5 over 2 as well. Okay, Because when we take the square root, we actually get plus or minus 5 over 2 as well. 
the minus basically comes from the fact that if x squared is equal to 25 over 4, x is actually plus or minus squared to 25 over 4, which is plus or minus 5 over 2. So x is strictly less than 5 over 2, but strictly greater than minus 5 over 2. Now for the second inequality. Now this looks quite complicated, but the first thing that we need to do, this is how I would do the second inequality. I would let f of x be equal to, I'm going to reorder the terms, minus 3x squared minus 5x plus 12. And let's actually just draw a graph of f of x and see what's going on. So let's first of all see what happens when f of x actually equals 0. Okay, so hopefully what we can see is that we can factorise this as well in the traditional way. So we've got minus 3x and x to give us the minus 3x squared. Now we're looking for combinations now which will actually achieve the minus 5x in the middle that we want from various different products uh, that make up 12. And we can see that actually, as this is factorised, we can see we've got minus 3x plus 4 and x plus 3. Uh, perhaps to make this a little bit easy, you can multiply both sides by minus 1 since it's critical solutions, so it doesn't matter. But basically, this is a negative quadratic, which means that we're going to have an n-shaped quadratic. It, it's also uh, intersects over here at 12. We've got f of x over here. Now, these critical solutions are really going to be important. We can see critical solutions when f of x equals 0 is when x is minus 3. And then we've also got x equals minus 4 over minus 3, which is 4 thirds. So uh, somewhere over here. Again, it doesn't have to be a work of art. This is nothing more than an ordinary sketch, guys. We've got something that looks like this. Uh, again, it doesn't have to be brilliant. But if you, if you notice, guys, we're interested when f of, f of x is actually greater than 0. So we're interested in this part of the curve. We can see all values of x, which are between minus 3 and 4 thirds, we can see that the curve is actually above the x-axis, which means that f of x is positive. So that means... Our solution is going to be when x is greater than minus 3 and less than 4 over 3. Okay, so that's basically, we've basically now got two solutions for x and the two different inequalities. But what we need to do next, we need to try and merge these two things together. So we are interested, aren't we, in... Um, solutions for x now which satisfy both of these inequalities. Now the best... What I'm going to do here, I'm going to draw a number line to make this a little bit easier. We've got here, we've got the first solution when x is between 5 over 2 minus 5 over 2. Well, that's basically just 2.5. So, we've got 2.5 over here, we've got minus 2.5 over here. And we can actually represent this on the number line. And we want, we're interested in the number line, which covers both of these inequalities. Then we've got four thirds. Well, four thirds is 1.3 recurring, isn't it? So four thirds is around about, um, around about over here, isn't it? So again, we can write these as fractions as well. But the most important thing is that you guys recognise that four thirds is less than five over two. That's really, really important. If you don't know that, then it's going to be really difficult to move forward. Minus 3 is clearly less than minus 2.5. So we can see we've got the other inequality where there's some overlap going on. And it's the overlap that's important. So we can see values of x which satisfy both inequalities go between minus 2.5 and 1.3 recurring, also 4 over 3. And basically that overlap is basically our final solution for x. So basically we can go to our solution over here, we can say minus 5 over 2, x is greater than minus 5 over 2, but less than 4 over 3. And that basically uh, concludes question number 24, and also concludes the whole paper as well. Guys, thank you very much for watching. 
If you've got any questions at all, please leave a comment in the comment section below and I will do my best to get back. I really enjoy doing these videos, guys, and if you've got any requests, anything you want me to go over, anything you're not too sure about, just let me know and I'll uh, make a video up. If you like this video, please uh, leave a like, tap that notification bell, and subscribe to my channel. And I will see you in the next video. Thank you very much.